Funding for this talk comes from TrialX, connecting patients to clinical trials. Hello, everyone. I'm Priya Menon, Scientific Media Editor at CureTalk, joining you from India. And on behalf of the CureTalks team, I welcome everyone here this evening. This is CureTalks' 75th episode. We are excited to inform our audience the launch of our new website. Please do visit us at www.curetalks.com and do send in your feedback to priya at trialx.com. Today, we are discussing Ebola a race towards a vaccine, and the other big questions. What about a cure? Media sheer coverage of the Ebola outbreak, as we all know, has been extensive. The quarantines, the deaths, the survivors, we are all the time hearing about this. But just to give a quick background about Ebola for our audience, um, here goes. Ebola is a very infectious virus that transmits from person to person. It may kill 60 to 90 percent of all infected humans. The virus can damage blood vessels and can cause internal bleeding, shock, and eventual death. According to the World Health Organization, the current Ebola outbreak has recorded over 17,000 cases and over 6,000 deaths. Currently, there is no FDA-approved Ebola vaccine available. Now, because of this, there is concern that the outbreak will continue and spread into other countries. So there's a lot of activity towards development of a safe and effective Ebola vaccine. The National Institutes of Health is supporting many experimental vaccines, and some of them are moving to clinical trials. One of NIH's collaborations is with Thomas Jefferson University which is developing a vaccine based on the established rabies vaccine. And today we have with us Dr. Matthias Johannes Schnell, who leads the rabies virus Ebola vaccine effort at Thomas Jefferson University to, dis- to discuss the subject. Dr. Schnell is Director, Immunology and Microbial Pathogenesis, PhD program at the Jefferson College of Medical Sciences, and Director, Jefferson Vaccine Center, Thomas Jefferson University. Welcome to Cure Talks, Dr. Schnell. Hello. Uh, the technology used in the vaccine developed by Dr. Schnell and his team is licensed to Excel Bio Inc. And we also have with us today Dr. Leonard Ruiz, the CEO of Excel Bio, to discuss the business side of this effort. Welcome to Cure Talks, Dr. Ruiz. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with uh, with you tonight. My co-host of the evening today is Julie Duluth. Julie is a professional writer. She's been writing professionally for over 15 years as a journalist and as an advertising copywriter. Welcome to the show, Julie. Thank you, Priya. It's an honor to be co-hosting with you. With that, I now hand over to Julie. She'll begin with the talk. Julie, you're on air? Yes. Thank you again, Dr. Schnell and Ruiz, for being here today. Since our time together is limited and we have a lot of ground to cover, we'll dive right in. Okay. Dr. Schnell, for the purpose of getting our audience on the same page, let's review some basic Ebola facts. Could you please tell us how Ebola is transmitted and what are its symptoms? Yeah, in in, in general... um between person, I mean, we have to decide between um, how you initially get infected. It's probably a virus um, in fruit bats where humans get initially infected. And then it actually gets um, transmitted between humans by um, contact with infectious body fluid, which can be basically um, blood, urine, um, and things like that. Yep. Correct. Um, I remember reading some articles in the, you know, people were all in a frenzy about uh, transmission, but really it, you have to be, it, the chances are a bit low. So Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's the most dangerous thing actually to get infected is um, 
during um, when when, pe- when people have the highest viral load is actually at the end of the infection. Um, then um, they highly infectious, but it's not an airborne disease. That's um, that's very clear. But you can easily get infected if you handle such patient without protection. Right. If I remember correctly, reading it's really um, especially medical workers who, you know, are at, at extremely high risk. Yeah, they are they at high risk because they take care for the patient, and the conditions are not always the one we we used to. Um, so, so that's certainly an issue. And you ask for symptoms. Symptoms are, are basically not very specific. I mean, it's one one symptom is certainly high fever, vomiting, diarrhea. But there are a lot of other viral infection where you can have these kind of symptoms. So um, it's not very specific. Like high fever is actually the, the, the best um, diagnostic um, thing, but then you still don't know if it's not one of the other diseases in these areas. Mm-hmm. Um, and are there any current treatments for Ebola? Or what methods are currently being used to prevent its spread for people at risk? Um, so, so there are two different things. So, first, what what methods are available to to prevent the spread? It's really just follow the guidelines from the CDC. Um, how you have to dress? You know, you need you need some eye protection, probably an eye shield. You need um, you know gloves and and booties and protected other gears. And if you really follow um, these instructions, and then you certainly shouldn't get infected by taking care for patients. Um, the other thing you, you ask, are there any therapies? And, you know, there are some therapies, but they all experimental. I mean, we, we have to realize that before that current outbreak, there was a lot of things in development, but there was really not the support you need to get such things. There was only a limited number of approaches in, in, in the clinic. So, um, yes, there is some therapy. Does it work? We really don't know because it was very limited tested in in um, in patients. So um, the answer is perhaps we don't know yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and for populations where Ebola is endemic, for example, West Africa, are there any ways to just prevent the general population, prevent the spread among the general population? Yeah, I mean, there are certain methods. A lot of a lot of the spread is probably also um, caused by cultural things, like they take care um, for the people who you know pass by the disease. Um, you know, the funerals are certainly a biggest concern because the people who die um, they have the highest viral load, and cultural they they start washing the bodies and things like that. That's certainly something. Which shouldn't be done and is not done anymore. Um, so safe bar- barrel of these um, people is, is certainly very important. And then just um, educational things certainly help too. So um, I think this is now more in place than it initially was. Well, let's turn to Dr. Ruiz now and hear from him. Dr. Ru- Dr. Ruiz, is it is it correct to assume that the Ebola vaccines will in largest numbers be needed in uh, poor countries, specifically West Africa? Oh, uh, definitely. You know, while there's a lot of emphasis now on a therapeutic product that could be used to treat uh, this current outbreak or, or the next outbreak, What's needed long-term to prevent this type of crisis from occurring again would be a vaccine, a prophylactic vaccine. And for that to be effective, it would have, um, once an effective vaccine was developed, it would have to be widely used in areas that would be at risk for Ebola infections in the future. Okay, so the vaccines that are being developed, it sounds like they are... um, would would mostly be used in in areas and countries and populations where the Ebola is endemic. We're not talking about mass vaccinations, uh, you know, in other parts of the world. You, you're not uh, 
really talking about mass vaccinations in other parts of the world, but you are talking about uh, vaccine use in other parts of the world, healthcare workers as an example that could uh, be uh, sent from the U.S. to uh, areas in Africa. You're talking potentially about laboratory workers that could be located outside of Africa that may be doing blood tissue samples. Uh, I believe uh, various military organizations have an, an interest uh, uh, potentially uh, companies that have um, operations in Africa, their uh, workers that would be sent from Europe or the U.S. would probably be vaccinated. So I think overall you could see a, a reasonable amount of vaccination uh, occurring outside of Africa, but the majority of doses would definitely be within uh, regions at risk in Africa itself. Mm -hmm. I see, and you know, it's not it's not like we'd uh, be giving out vaccines here in the U.S. for Ebola like like a flu shot. It would be for health workers and people who have reasonable risk to be exposed to it. Uh, yes, I mean, once a, a, an Ebola vaccine was licensed by the FDA, in principle, anyone could go to their physician and get a prescription for that and be immunized. For it, but I assume the physician would ask, well, you know, why would you want to be immunized against Ebola unless you're planning to travel to Africa or for, or you work with um, um, laboratory samples here in the U.S. that may originate in Africa or some valid reason. So I think that uh, the use of a, a vaccine, an Ebola vaccine for the general population in the U.S. would probably not occur unless there was sure. a large outbreak in the U.S for some reason, right. and that's very unlikely. Uh, now, uh, I remember uh, reading in the newspaper that the first vaccines were, um, at least had started being developed some 10 or 20 years ago and were put on hold because um, I think, if I remember correctly, they weren't profitable. So is the production of an Ebola vaccine now, will that be profitable for pharmaceutical companies? Well, let me address the first part about the vaccines being put on hold because they weren't profitable. The really uh, the vaccines that have undergone clinical trials initially over the years were put on hold because they weren't effective, in, at least in the types of testing that had been done on those vaccines. So there really has not been a uh, um, a very promising Ebola vaccine that has moved forward in clinical trials historically past the phase one clinical trial testing, which is mainly a safety evaluation of the vaccine. But the issue of profitability, there had been very little research in the past related to developing Ebola vaccines in, a, in the major pharmaceutical companies, vaccine companies, because the, the perception uh, prior to this current outbreak is that an Ebola vaccine would not be a very profitable vaccine. It would be uh, limited to use in uh, certain regions of Africa, probably small numbers of uh, patients being immunized or subjects uh, being immunized. If historically, you know, what we don't hear a lot about in the current crisis is that there's been Ebola uh, infections in Africa going back to 1976. And, and those infections usually uh, have involved uh, a handful of patients to a few hundred patients. Uh, previously, as an example, in, uh, as recently as 2012, there were several countries uh, in Africa where Ebola was identified. Uh, total number of cases were uh, less than 100. Uh, the number of deaths were less than 25, I believe. So that doesn't really represent a, a very exciting market opportunity or did not represent a very exciting market opportunity for a pharmaceutical company that would have to spend literally hundreds of millions of dollars to develop and get a, an Ebola vaccine through regulatory approval. Well, the whole world related to Ebola vaccines has changed with the current uh, crisis. There's been over $30 billion of economic damage done due to the economy uh, in different parts of the world directly related to uh, the Ebola outbreak. So there's a definite need to uh, immunize a large number of people. 
And I think the pharmaceutical industry is recognizing that need where two of the major pharmaceutical companies, GSK and Merck, are currently working in the Ebola vaccine area. And and last week, the uh, Gavi Alliance, which is the uh, nonprofit organization funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to provide vaccines to developing countries, pledged $300 million to purchase Ebola vaccines when they're available. So I think the market uh, has finally been quantified as a very significant market opportunity for the pharmaceutical industry. Um, one more question for you uh, before we turn to doc- back to Dr. Schnell and find out specifically about the vaccine his team is developing. Um, but first, can you tell us briefly how many vaccines are in the pipeline right now? Well, they're really, uh, you, you, in the popular press, in the media, if you will, uh, there only seems to be two vaccines in the pipeline, and that's the one that's being developed by GSK and the uh, other by Merck and New Link. But in actual fact, uh, obviously we have our uh, rabies uh, Ebola uh, vaccine that was developed by Dr. Schnell in, in the uh, NIH. And also there, there are... Um, uh, several other vaccines that are at various stages of early development. But uh, I think that, you know, Dr. Schnell can provide a lot more detail. But um, even though the media is only really covering two vaccines uh, uh, because they are in phase one clinical trials, there, there really are um, uh, a half a dozen other vaccines in the pipeline, in, including our uh, Ebola vaccine based on the rabies vector. Dr. Schnell, then now's a good time to um, get some more detail from you about the vaccine your team is developing and how it differs from the ones in, in the past. Yeah. Okay. So, so our vaccine is actually um, based on on an established rabies virus vaccine for humans. Um, it's it's not that well known, but uh, currently used rabies vaccine is actually a deactivated, in, uh, inactivated um, vaccine. So what we call the killed vaccine. So it's not a live viral um, vector like the GSK and the Merck um, vaccine, which comes with their own problems. It's a deactivated one, which is um, based on a established human rabies vaccine. And what we did, we just put into this rabies virus one gene which um, encodes an uh, important antigen of Ebola virus, that surface glycoprotein, and we engineered the virus in such a way that now the variants which we normally use um, to vaccinate against rabies can be also used um, to be vaccinated against Ebola. So it's basically one vaccine against um, two diseases. And what is perhaps important to know is this also addressed the previous problem with the marketability of, of an Ebola vaccine because rabies is a huge problem in Africa. So we, and we thought including another pathogen would be very helpful to make this a more attractive vaccine for these areas where we have both of these problems. Mm-hmm. And what about what is the expected efficacy of the vaccine? Um, we we would you know so that's an important point. So actually, for Ebola vaccine, there's not really um, any good model except non-human primates. So what you normally do is you immunize non-human primates with your vaccine, and then you challenge them with Ebola and. The efficiency of this vaccine should be that you can protect monkeys to get in the next phase, which would be humans. And we can do that with our vaccine. We know that. So it's expected to be uh, pretty good then, pretty high, the efficacy based on the trials. Yeah, I mean, and and then the problem is, what means the problem? You really have to test it in humans. What you see in monkeys is just a hint that it may work. And, and then you go in this area 
of safety? Do you have unexpected um, issues, which we just heard from the Merck vaccine, um, which happens already in the phase one? So we don't know if it's serious or not. But, you know, and then you have to see, do you get the same immune responses, which you see in monkeys, in humans? So that's normally how you do that. Well, that's that's a good segue into safety then. Um, how safe is the uh, or will be the Ebola vaccine, and what what uh, side effects or risks are you anticipating? Yeah, I mean, um, with the rabies vaccine, with our rabies-based vaccine, um, we know from the million of doses which got used in humans that you really don't have major side effects except, you know, some pain um, at the inoculation time. Um, but we have to see if we included other um, antigen, if the change, we don't expect it. But therefore, you do a small phase one study to really confirm that what you expect is really true. So, I mean, vaccines in general have to be very, very safe. Because especially for Ebola, you shouldn't forget the current outbreak is certainly horrible. Um, but we had for almost 30 years only small outbreaks. So you most likely will immunize a lot of people which never will get um, infected, which also make it really difficult to see if your vaccine is efficient, right? So mm -hmm. that's also issues, and we feel because the death rate in Africa through rabies is very high, probably 20,000 people a year, we at least will protect against death and we can see efficiency um, of the rabies infection. So there's another, um, you know, justification to use this vaccine. What will be the suggested administration then in terms of doses and population? Would, would this vaccine be for children as well as adults? Yeah, that's another good question. So the rabies vaccine is certainly um, you can use in children. Um, you can use, um, so in, um, it can used in, be, be used in pregnant women. Um, there's no age restriction because it's such a serious disease. You certainly have to test it. You probably test first um, the usual group of volunteers, which is, as far as I know, um, 18 to 49 healthy adults with no, um, for, for any unexpected side effects. So, because that's a population which can best deal with side effects. Like we, we had um, in the first phase one of the GSK vaccine, we had one volunteer who developed, she or he, I don't know, developed a fever of about 40 degrees. That's certainly for a healthy person something not too bad, but for older person or very young one, that may be too risky. So all that has to be evaluated step by step. So you're saying that there's a chance that um, even though this Ebola vaccine seems so promising, that it, it still yet might fail once um, you know once we go through all the safety precautions, and that, and that even then we have to you know we have to see how it's it, it works with the, an actual human population as opposed to, um, you know, the non-human primate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just want to remind you about um, the HIV, which was based on adenovirus, a Merck HIV vaccine, which actually failed in a phase three and looked promising before. So it, and this it can take... is currently in phase, in which phase? No, I mean, we talk about HIV vaccines now. But just as an example, that vaccines can fail at phase one, at phase two, at phase three. So um, currently what we have for Ebola is only phase one. Um, okay. And I, I think most of these vaccines will move on probably to a phase two because there are maybe some concerns, but not um, that major that you can move on. But then when you're done with the safety, you have to show it's 
efficient too, and it really induces good antibody. And nobody looked so far how long will they last, right? If you give a vaccine, you need protection. You should have protection for years. That's something mm-hmm. we just don't know because nobody looked into it, except we know the GSK vaccine really doesn't provide long-term protection in monkeys. So if that is the case in humans, then you also have to think about what you will do afterwards. Well, let's turn back to Dr. Ruiz then for more on the, the business side of things. Dr. Ruiz, how rapidly can the commercial production of this vaccine take place if it is successfully makes it through all the phases of the trial? Well, specifically for the uh, Ebola vaccine that we're working on, um, uh, we're already working with a commercial vaccine manufacturer in Germany, a well-established company that has the resources in place that could scale up um, <clears throat> to manufacture millions of doses of, of this uh, uh, of our vaccine in a very short period of time. The key is getting through the the regulatory process. First, the phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And while you're moving through that regulatory process, particularly as you get in the latter stages of the phase two and then the phase three trial, to really have your manufacturing uh, capabilities lined up. And as I said, we've already started on on that uh, uh, with a with a well-established vaccine manufacturer. And I'm sure the same uh, would be true for. Uh, GSK and Merck, I mean, these are large vaccine manufacturing companies. They have resources available. But those resources, those plants, uh, manufacturing plants, also have to have the capacity to manufacture this particular, their particular Ebola vaccine at this point in time. So usually a, a manufacturer tries not to have their plants sitting idle. They're manufacturing potentially other products, so the uh, – Changing over to a bowler vaccine requires a planning process, but the uh, both the, uh, the GSK and the Merck vaccines are in phase one trials. Normally, it, uh, it would take uh, uh, another uh, two years to get through a phase two and phase three trial, and that would be a very abbreviated trials uh, before regulatory approval. So we're really looking at a two-year time frame to organized manufacturing to, to to continue organizing manufacture <clears throat> manufacturing for commercial production and the projected cost of producing the vaccine I, I'm sorry I didn't hear the first part of your question what's the projected cost of producing the vaccine well we really uh won't know that until we're actually running the final formulation through a plant. But fortunately for for us, with uh, uh, the history of uh, the rabies vaccine and the product, the, the Ebola rabies vaccine that we'll be manufacturing, uh, we can extrapolate costs um, that have been established for manufacturing rabies vaccines uh, literally in a number of uh, uh, countries around the world. Uh, currently, a uh, uh, half a dozen plants produce existing rabies vaccines. So we, we're quite certain we can manufacture a relatively inexpensive vaccine, potentially the, the least costly of any of the the uh, Ebola vaccines in the pipeline. But the thing that uh, I think is important to mention here is that even though long-term vaccine manufacturing may be quite inexpensive, Initially, that scale up for a new product in manufacturing in a plant could be quite costly. Um, uh, it's very unusual to uh, produce any new product and not have some of the lots not meet your specifications. And so that goes into the overall cost of the product. And <clears throat> you know, it doesn't matter whether you're manufacturing a vaccine or any other pharmaceutical product, you know, each lot that one produces has to go through very stringent lot re- release and safety testing. And during that first ramp up in manufacturing, um, until the, the plant, any plant is operating very efficiently, uh, some of those lots do not meet those uh, criteria and have to be destroyed. 
do you anticipate that the the cost uh, per person would be um, feasible enough that it would be able the vaccine would be able to be distributed to um, you know such large populations in Africa in poor countries such as Africa? Uh, definitely, as well as uh, Gavi has already guaranteed three hundred million dollars to purchase vaccine initially. So uh, that should uh, allow for quite a broad uh, vaccination program in Africa. And how how would the vaccine be distributed? Would it be through um, the health system, well, local health systems, or is there a plan for that? Well, there's. Uh, I don't believe anyone has a plan in place, but fortunately there's already good infrastructure for vaccine distribution in Africa for vaccines in general. Um, in most um, of the national um, health care systems uh, in the African countries have resources for vaccine de- delivery, and then you have UNICEF and Doctors Without Borders in other uh, organizations like that that are involved in vaccine distribution systems. So I don't think we will need a new vaccine distribution system for Ebola. Uh, We'll be able to use existing uh, vaccine distribution, but probably uh, they'll have to put in place some priority uh, immunization programs to make sure that as uh, as many high-risk individuals in certain geographical areas get uh, immunized as quickly as possible. Let's turn now to the title of the show today, which is Racing Toward a Vaccine, But What About a Cure? And this is uh, posed to both of you, so feel free to um, enter into discussion. And the question is, there seems to be a lot of work being done on an Ebola vaccine, but not so much about a cure. Is prevention the only way? Are we looking into cures? Would our efforts yeah, be I mean, spent on a cure than prevention? I mean, the cure is the sort of a cure is is as far as I would say not very um, reasonable <laughs> because just of cost on on and on infrastructure. I mean, if you look, so just let me address. Point number one, if you really want to cure a viral infection like polio or measles where, or, or pox virus where we did that, you have to make sure that there's no animal host or it's ho- hopeless. And actually, that's a problem with Ebola virus. You probably have, um, you know, natural hosts which don't get sick and carry the virus around. So you, you probably can't prevent... Um, reinfection of humans from time to time. By only human diseases, you can vaccinate everybody, and even that is a huge problem. So um, it will be very difficult and to um, cure it from already infected. People be working on that. Everybody works on that um, with antibody and, you know, but that is just very, very costly and I don't think that this country has um, these resources. I mean, we heard already that just by better taking care for people, you can increase their survival rate by about 10, 15 percent by providing them with fluids and things like that. But all that would require a better health infrastructure. So I actually think in the um, short run, the vaccine is the only chance. And even in highly developed countries like, you know, the US or, or Europe, a vaccine is always the best way to prevent disease. It's relatively cheap. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit um, hard to to imagine a cure by drugs or treatment. Um, you certainly need to um, have better treatment option. You probably can. There are um, some things out there which are very likely to to work, like antibodies if you have the right one. We know that serum from people who were infected, if you transfer it to other people, they actually have a good chance to survive 
But as I said, this all requires a relatively good um, health system, and especially it's probably not practical if you have, you know, thousands of cases. It may work with if you have 10 or 100 cases. Okay. Now, maybe I can add some, some comments there. Uh, there. There are actually uh, quite a number of companies working on treatments for Ebola, and for whatever reason, they haven't caught the media attention the way vaccine development has. You know, maybe GSK and Merck have better public relations departments to uh, publicize what they're doing. But uh, uh, right now, as an example, the, the World Health Organization is sponsoring a, a clinical trials to look at the uh, the convalescent ser serum that that uh, Dr. Schnell was just talking about, meaning they're taking blood from patients that have recovered. Uh, they're processing that to remove the bl red blood cells, and then they're giving that serum to patients that need treatment. And historically, uh, these types of products have been uh, effective in some cases with uh, uh, with patients with other viral diseases. They're usually more effective if the Serum is concentrated to concentrate what's called the immunoglobulin fraction, uh, where you actually deliver an immunoglobulin concentrate. But that's timely and, co and costly to do that. Uh, a great example of that has been treatments for hepatitis B and also treatment for rabies. Uh, immunoglobulin fractions, concentrates, have been used historically and have been very effective. But uh, we're talking about usually thousands of dollars per dose or per treatment, rather, here in the U.S. Um, the use of antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, probably the one product that's gotten quite a bit of press is ZMAP, which was used in uh, one of the physicians that was treated at, uh, or one of the uh, people that was treated at the CDC. But there's currently there's no evidence that the ZMAP map which is a mixture of three monoclonal antibodies has worked because there really wasn't enough material available to really test it in any sort of clinical trial. But several groups are working on making more of that material. Uh, and then a number of companies, drug companies, are working on antiviral compounds to try to treat Ebola. But again, if you look at, uh, at the success of chemical compounds that have been successfully developed to treat viral diseases, there are basically almost none in the marketplace. It's been very difficult for medical science uh, to develop compounds that will effectively uh, treat viral diseases versus bacterial diseases, you know, antibiotics being a great example there. So, again, a lot of activity mm -hmm. going on, but no uh, uh, major, or well, actually no successes at all in the treatment area to date. Do either of you have an opinion on government enforced quarantines? Pardon me, I, I didn't hear the. Yes, um, do either of you have an opinion on government enforced quarantines? Uh, I, I don't, because I really don't understand the logistics of what would be involved in type that type of area. But historically. Uh, quarantine in infectious diseases has been used, so it's not, you know, some new proposal. But I, I think that, at least from from my perspective, it uh, uh, would know would need to know a lot of a lot more details about how that would be applied. Yeah, I mean, it 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 can be used if it's based on facts and not on elections. I would say um, it certainly is effective to prevent spread, but. Um, you always have to careful, um, you know, analyze the negative effects if you if you tell people and the area where it is, you know, um, if you tell people just to stay home, um, that may work or not. We, it really depends on the case. I mean, with a with a big flu outbreak, people stayed home and got infected through the mailman post, you know, when the mail came. So. Um, I think it was a little bit overdone, um, overstated, um, but it certainly can be effective. So, I mean, if you come home from an affected country and run a high fever, I mean, it's in your own I, um, 
interest probably to uh, um, isolate you from other people. It really depends on the case, um, but it, it has been done, and it certainly would be done um, if there would be a larger outbreak here. I'm, I'm sure about that. Yeah, certainly Cuba, and um, you know, is famous for for using quarantines to spread the control of disease. Yeah. All right, well, Priya, I'm going to hand the the discussion back over to you then in case there have been any questions submitted by our audience through email or the phone. Thank you so much, Jimmy. That was an amazing discussion, Dr. Ruiz and Dr. Schnell. Um, Dr. Schnell, I was just listening to you uh, uh, talk about uh, the immunity uh, term, term period for a vaccine. Um, can you tell me how much, um, uh, how long with the vaccine you're working in on provide immunity? Are we talking about a one-time vaccine or are we talking about um, annual vaccines? Yeah, we talk, you know, with, it really depends what you use. Um, if you use a live viral vaccine, um, you, you may go, get away with one inoculation you you actually need to get away with one inoculation because in the second round you neutralize your vector with our killed one so far we we go for prime boost but um it may be actually sufficient um a single inoculation two inoculation i think are reasonable too but if a vaccine which you have to apply yearly would be very very difficult to um, make people to comply with, I think. I mean, you know what happens with the influenza vaccine where you exactly have to do that. The compliance rate is normally not that great, especially in countries which have not so, uh, good infrastructure. Um, normally, you have people going through the area and vaccinate people. So a single-shot vaccine would be certainly the best. Um, the second best would be a long-term prime boost where you vaccinate with other vaccines which need two inoculations. There are plenty of them. Um, but then you would hope for a long-lasting vaccine. Um, like, like rabies, most people get immunized against rabies um, three times within a month, and um, a lot of them have a lifelong immunity. That would be probably the best. And if that would be possible to do that with a single inoculation, it would be even better. Yes. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I have, we have received quite a few questions from our listeners, and uh, I believe uh, we have covered about uh, half of them over the course of the discussion. Um, but I think there are still some more that we can maybe touch up today. Um, uh, Dr. Shnall, this one I think is for you. Uh, there are quite a few issues being discussed regarding use of placebos in Ebola drug trials. Uh, what is your opinion on use of placebos in control groups? Yeah, this is um, this is difficult. I mean, you 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 actually can't really have a control group for experiment like that because you not um, you not even will um, know um, if it's effective because hopefully you won't actually um, be exposed. For example, so if you would go for high risk people like people which have a chance to get exposed to Ebola virus, you certainly ethically couldn't just, if you think you have a good, safe vaccine, you, sh you certainly would need to give that to all the people. And then you probably just would check by, is in general the infection rate on first responder and nurses going down, which have a really high risk. So, um, but you certainly wouldn't, like with a, with a regular um, drug design, um, clinical trial to have a control group which would be not vaccinated. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, Dr. Ruiz, I think uh, you mentioned a three-year time period for commercial production of a vaccine. Uh, one of our listeners has something regarding that. He asks, uh, in the wake of testing of one of the experimental Ebola vaccines licensed to work being stopped due to vaccines causing joint pains to vaccinated volunteers, how long would it take for vaccines to be tested and safe to be and made available to the public? Well, you know, normally uh, uh, before Ebola came along, a traditional vaccine testing went through 
a, a phase one of 50 uh, volunteers of that order of magnitude of uh, individuals. And, and that uh, trial would normally take about one year. And then a phase two safety study, which may have been several hundred uh, individuals, which would probably have taken, um, well, safety and efficacy, would have probably taken several uh, years, two years, and then a phase three trial, which could have been a, a, a three-year time frame, um, and, and this would have been a very accelerated program, again, prior to Ebola. So you really would be looking at, you know, a six, seven, eight-year time frame through clinical trials. With, with Ebola, the regulatory agencies both here in the U.S., the FDA, and in Europe, uh, the EMA, European Medicines um, Authority, uh, have agreed that they will fast track the clinical trials for Ebola, so they'll uh, respond to all of the paperwork uh, needed uh, to move forward on clinical trials as quickly as possible. So we really are seeing phase one clinical trials being done in very short time frames, literally six months type of time frames. The phase two trials that uh, are uh, going to be started shortly uh, appear to also to, to be planned to be very short in uh, length, approximately one year. And then uh, the plans for a phase, phase three trials haven't been completely disclosed. But again, those tend to uh, look like they'll be a very short time frame. So I, I would say from today, there is the possibility that a uh, Ebola vaccine virus could have completed a uh, a phase two and phase three trial in in uh, a little over two years. How long it would take for the regulatory authorities to review that information and then approve that vaccine would probably be a very short period of time considering the urgency needed. But, uh, I mean, there's a crisis going on today, and there's really a need for a, a therapy or a vaccine today, but literally we're two years or more away from having that product, at least approved by a regulatory agency. Uh, trials which uh, normally take years and decades are being fast-tracked on a time scale of weeks and months. Dr. Schnell, what could be some of the disadvantages of fast-forwarding vaccine trials? Again, I, I didn't... What, what would be the advantage of... Fast-forwarding the vaccine trials, uh, since uh, normally they take years and decades. Uh, so the, pers uh, the listener wants to know if we are fast-tracking some of the trials and what could be some of the disadvantages of doing so. I mean, the advantage of doing that is, is um, that you just get a, a, a faster answer um, if it's working and if it's safe especially if it's safe, and then you can go further in the testing. So it's certainly the advantage um, that we get a faster answer. Are there any disadvantages of uh, doing it so quick? Disadvantages? No, I think... I think you, if you if you follow um, your protocols, you you can get the answers just faster. You know, a lot of a lot is not only doing the clinical work. A lot is also to deal with um, the regulatory agency, and that can take for months. So, if they respond um, faster because they realize it's really urgent, then you really can cut out months um, out of that process. So it's it's it doesn't have to be a higher risk to do it fast. And I certainly think the regulatory agencies will look in, into that, that not unnecessary risks are taken. Uh, there, is one, uh, er, there is one area that uh, has been shown in the past with vaccines uh, related to, to risk, and, and this is a, a rare, risk, a rare uh, risk that may show up only in very large populations. So if one moves through quickly in small groups, you may miss this rare adverse events or, or side effects that could occur with the, with the vaccine. But again, uh, one has to measure the risk versus the benefit, and I'm sure the regulatory agencies will ultimately have to look at that. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look, you know, if you do a phase one and you have 50 people, and you will say you get negative effect in in five, then that's 10 percent. So that's something very obvious, you know. If you have a risk, which you know, based on our genetic, which is quite different in different um, people, a risk which will only occur in one of 10,000, you know, you literally need 10,000 people. Um, and and that certainly can can be easily done. So therefore, we normally check also in vaccines in the long run, and every side effect is reported, and then it's checked if that is actually related to the vaccine. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, almost the last question. One of our listeners write in asking uh, that uh, most people considered Ebola to be a disease that was happening in a far-off country, and now it's knocking at our doors. Uh, what should people in America be cautious about? Uh, Dr. Washing Lee? their hands, for, washing their hands to prevent flu. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think realistically. <laughs> Uh, uh, the probability of uh, Ebola occurring here in, in an outbreak here in the U.S. would be pretty minimal. Uh, it is like any other infectious disease, uh, and uh, there there are a lot of uh, potential barriers in place to prevent uh, the spread of Ebola, even if we would have uh, one or more individuals that would arrive in the in in the U.S. that uh, would uh, be carrying the Ebola virus, I think our healthcare infrastructure could quickly uh, isolate and care for those individuals and, and print, prevent any type of spread that you've seen in Africa. So I I really uh, um, I think that uh, there's been too much media hype uh, related to Ebola, uh, uh, where. There's gener- it, it's generated a lot of concern here in the U.S. and Europe, and I think the probability of a, a spread in uh, Western uh, countries would be very low uh, at this point in time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ruiz and Dr. Schnell. We wish your team the very best in getting this Ebola vaccine ready for use and for saving a lot of lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us today. I sec- uh, Julie, I it was second that. great that's hosting the yeah. show with you. Thank you so much. Well, uh, the well, broadcast we link will be shared with broadcast link right. will be shared with all the participants via email today. And uh, please visit CureTalks.com for details on upcoming shows. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for thank having you for, us. Uh, yes, thank you for having us. Yeah, there's a lot of hope and promise wrapped up in this. So uh, we wish you guys the best and uh, lots of fast tracking. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.